Childs, and I'm a musical theater writer. But that's not what's important today. What's important today is that I am going to interview John Kander, musical theater legend. He is part of the incredible team of Kander and Ebb who have written so many great, important, fabulous musical theater works uh, such as Cabaret, Chicago, Curtains, Kiss of the Spider Woman, 70 Girl 70, The Visit, The Act, The Ring, Steel Pier. Also currently at the Vineyard Theater, the amazing, amazing theater work, Scottsboro Boys. My musical theater aesthetic was shaped by Candor and Ebb because my very first show in which I got my equity card was a touring production of Chicago. It was an amazing time and, and John Candor's music, every time I heard the opening number, all that jazz, that's what musical theater is, it's, it's extraordinary. So, one thing is clear. The music is exhilarating, thrilling, soaring. And so I'm really excited to talk to John Kander about what he does to make him who he is. Hi, John. <laughs> I can't believe we were doing this. I'm so happy to see you, though. Same here. Come on up. Thank you. Very chivalrous. Thank it's you. a good, it's very good exercise. <laughs> oh my God. It's a... Look at that. Uh, Tony Award for? One would be for Cabaret, I think. Definitely Cabaret. I think one is for Kiss of the Spider Woman. Okay. And one is for Woman of the Year, believe it or not. I believe it. Emmys. The great thing about Emmys, mm -hmm. which if you want to get this down, the, 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 Emmys are better awards than anything because of the sharp points at the end, and you could really hurt somebody with it, <laughs> it uh, just so you know that. It's, I'm going to try to get one for that purpose. Yes, it's, it's very, you can protect yourself. I, you know, defensive Emmys. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a Kennedy Center Award, and... Yep. This was uh, this was the, our, our oh, class at the Kennedy, Kennedy Center. Wow. That was really impressive, I must say. What happened? What, anything it's just that remember? all of a sudden you're there, and you're there with all these incredible people. And I was standing next to Willie Nelson when we were all having our picture taken. Mm -hmm. You're looking at a room full of everybody you ever heard of in your life, and every politician you ever heard of in your life. Wow. And I turned to him, I turned him and I, I said, I feel like we're in some kind of movie. And he said, yeah, but those are the most expensive fucking extras I've ever seen in your life. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, that was, that was an event. And is that a Grammy a for a cabaret? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know you know it is. I but do, no, I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't deal with this a lot. What I deal with are are the CDs. There's more in here. It's kind of a sickness. Wow, so, and the, these CDs are? It's almost all classical. Wow, yeah, I see. Well, I love classical music. Do you remember your first classical piece that really moved you? I don't remember the first piece because I sort of grew up with it all, all the time and I was listening from the time I was very young. I do remember seeing the first opera I ever saw in Kansas City. Mm -hmm. When I was 10, a little company came through and they did Aida. I was in the first row with my feet dangling in the celli, looking up at these enormous people. And uh, I was really overwhelmed by it. So your parents liked um, classical music and opera? Everybody in my family loved music. My father had a, a big, booming voice and he loved to sing. and and people like to hear him sing. And my brother sang and I played the piano and my aunt played the piano and my mother was tone deaf. Oh my gosh, you're kidding. No, it, it, she had rhythm. But, but, she, but she enjoyed the music anyway? Well, sort of. It, 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 when, <laughs> when we went, to see, she took me to see Aida and then I was overwhelmed by it and the next day they were doing Madame Butterfly and I wanted to go and I pestered her and she said, she said 
oh no, it's not really very good. You wouldn't like it. She had, she had put up with the night before. And my aunt took me, said, well, I'll take him. And then I'd saw Madame Butterfly. And then it was years before I totally trusted anything my mother <laughs> told me. Again. Actually, after dinner a lot, sometimes we'd go in the living room, my father would sing and I'd play. Mm -hmm. Then dad would say, play a march for your mother because she had rhythm. So I would play a march and she would get up and she'd march around the chair. And that would be her, her contribution to the evening. Yeah, anyway, we had a, there was music in the house yeah, all the time. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, would, did you ever write any songs for your father or brother, uh, you know, personal songs for them to sing? Accompany. You know, something I don't remember, I was always writing. I, mean, I remember when I was in second grade in arithmetic class, the teacher asked me a question and I couldn't answer it. She said, what are you doing? I said, I'm writing a Christmas carol. <laughs> and so that's the first thing I remember writing. And she came back and looked at it and Sure enough, there was great big notes and all about Jesus in the manger. So she made me stay after school and she played it. Eventually they did it at the Christmas assembly, but I found out years later that she had called my folks and said, I just want you to know that John wrote a Christmas carol. Is that all right? Because I know you're Jewish. <laughs> and they said that was, just, that was fine. And there was always music. I never thought about the fact that there shouldn't be uh, I was really lucky because, in that sense, because it was nothing professional about it. Uh, nobody in my family was ever a professional musician, but it was like music is a part of Their what your life is like. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Oh my God, look at these walls. This is fabulous. Lots of cabaret. Yeah, this is sort of a cabaret section. We were really lucky to catch up. Was this from the movie? Yeah, this, I think it's the first film I ever scored. It was a television film about AIDS. Mm-hmm, I remember that. And Happy Time and Chicago, Chicago in Sweden. This is uh, about 19 years ago. This is the beginning of a kind of family that still exists. Scott Ellis, who had been in the rink mm -hmm. as one of the guys, uh, asked us if he could uh, do a little production of of Floor of the Red Menace, which the Vineyard Theater produced. And he brought along a choreographer that we had never met named Susan Stroman, and a friend of his who rewrote the book named David Thompson, Tommy Thompson. Mm -hmm. And Scott and Stro and Tommy Thompson and Fred and I uh, became a kind of family and we've worked together constantly for the, for the last almost 20 years. And so this was your first production at the Vineyard and Scotts and, and Scottsboro is, is there now with, with Susan Stroman uh, directing and Tommy Thompson doing the book. Absolutely, yeah. But it's, a, it's been a wonderful family and uh, there are other people in that family, you know, Karen Ziemba and Deb Monk and, and, and some others, but we, try to see to it that we all work together as, as often as possible. I loved that at the, at the um, Vineyard event honoring you, um, the, way, the way that you talked about family, because um, all of the people, Cheetah and Liza Minnelli mm -hmm. and Deborah Monk and Karen Ziemba and so many people were there and, and uh, it was such a wonderful thing to see your family there. It was really fun. Uh, that, that was a really incredible evening. Thank you so much. Look at these. They're Scottsboro Boys. Scottsboro Boys? These posters up here are sort of in order of when they were done. Mm -hmm. uh, James and William Goldman and I wrote, we were all living together and we wrote a musical called A Family Affair. Mm -hmm. It ran a whole month, I think. <laughs> and Hal Prince came in, who was a friend at that time, and after much begging, took over the direction of it for 10 days, and he almost made it work. And I think it's the first musical he ever directed. Really? Floor of the Red Menace was also not a success. And Hal Prince, who produced it, said two weeks before we opened, whatever happens with the show, uh, we'll meet at my house the day after and we'll start working on the next piece. Mm -hmm. Flora opened and it was not a success. But uh, next day we went to Hal's house and started working on the next piece, which was Cabaret. And I've always said I can't think of a producer today who would, who would 
take a chance on two unknown people uh, right after they'd brought him a flop. <laughs> that was just an act of faith that I'll never forget. There is the couch on which I sat and read your script. Uh, a bunch of us were to vote on a, an award. I'm addressing the camera now. <laughs> we were handed scripts with no names on them. And I remember sitting, sitting on that couch and reading this terrific script and uh, saying, well, this is obviously the winner, and it turned out to be Kirsten's. I was so thrilled. It's like, John Kander, you are my mentor, and you don't even know. <laughs> and well, then it turned all, out I, you were. That was when I taught you, you all did. those steps. You to, uh, taught me, well, yeah. <laughs> no, Bob Fosse taught me the steps, <laughs> but you taught me all I knew really about musical theater, because as I say, it was the first musical that I knew, that I actually was completely exposed to, and it so imprinted itself on me. So your music you. is always there in my heart. So thanks. You're welcome. Okay. So John, I understand you are a composer that uses finale. Yes, I am. I, uh, I was really, really lucky mm -hmm. uh, because uh, David Pogue, who now writes for the New York Times, was a composer and a very good composer, as a matter of fact, as as well as a computer guy. Mm -hmm. He introduced me to Finale, and, and he had uh, written the, the manual for it. It was a program which I really loved because it used to be, oh, for instance, if I would, if Fred and I had written a song, and I'd very painstakingly written out the arrangement for it, and then so after it was all done, he would call me and he said, you know that place in the middle of the bridge and say, uh, I want to change those, 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 those two lines. And then I would curse him under my breath. I'd get out my eraser and I'd uh, do the whole thing over again. And then, of course, with Finale, mm -hmm. uh, everything changed. It was I would smile on the phone <laughs> and just re-enter the lyrics. and uh, Cut and paste. You bet. <laughs> When you're writing a song that's not for Cheetah, but if Cheetah's going to sing it, you automatically know that it's going to be in several keys lower than where you wrote it. So uh, let me see if I can find something out here. Uh, um, here's the, here is the song in the key that we wrote it. This song is in C. They, they sing it in C. Mm -hmm. uh, if Cheetah were going to sing this song, I, I'd know that she could not sing it in this key. She'd mm -hmm. probably sing it in A flat. I clicked on the key change. Okay. Uh, and it would bring up a key signature here. Mm -hmm. And let's say I've decided that Cheetah's going to sing this in A flat, so I would go to A flat major. That's the A flat. I also understand that a lot of composers refuse to use, um, you know, a music program. They just want to write it out, and I'm just, I admire the fact that you're, you know... Well, the fact is you don't, you don't really compose on it. The composition part comes uh, uh, right. earlier, and you, you write... Uh, scratch notes to yourself or illegible things or that look like Beethoven's manuscripts. But then when you, when you finally come to entering it here, then it's nice and clean. Since David taught me this program, I must, I've done about five musicals on it and four film scores, and it's just made everything so much easier. In terms of when you work with Fred, which comes first, music or lyrics, or does it, is well, it? Fred and I started working together in 1962, as I mm -hmm. said. And we immediately started working in, in a way that, w that continued right up to his death. Mm -hmm. We worked in the same room at the same time. Uh, Fred could improvise in rhyme and meter in the same way that I could improvise at a keyboard. When we were writing for the theater, which was most of the time, mm -hmm. uh, we would just do a lot of talking about a character, about what this moment needs to say. Eventually, either a phrase would come with Fred or a rhythmic idea mm -hmm. from me, and 
it's not possible to say in, in our case what which comes first. Right. It's just it was uh, it was always kind of like this, and uh, we'd lop over into each other's territory. But the interesting part of it is that uh, Fred and I were very very different people. And yet, when we got into that, we usually worked at his house because he'd like to stay home, and I, he was four blocks from here, and I would go there. Mm -hmm. And he had a, a little room which acted as a studio with a, an upright piano. And w when we'd get in that room and start to work, mm -hmm. uh, all our differences would disappear truly, mm -hmm. and uh, and it was like we became sort of one person. I, I would characterize his writing as, I mean, he had heart too, but there was a lot of acerbic wit, biting, funny wit. Well, I guess wit right. is funny. <laughs> and you had a lot of passionate, romantic heart in your music, and yet you were able to wield the two of them together. That's what I heard in the, in the, the lyrics and in the music, and, but I'm just wondering in life what your sort of outlooks on life were. Uh, certainly that applies. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Fred was a real New Yorker, mm -hmm. and I was really from Kansas City, and maybe, maybe that's the difference, I don't know. Fred is very city, was very city-oriented. Mm -hmm. I live half my life in the country, more if I could. Actually, this is, this is an anecdote which may almost define us. I built a house in the country in 1973. Shortly after I built the house, Fred got very sulky. He said, you've never had me to the country. I said, you hate the country. No, I don't. And he said, you've had other people up there. And I said, uh, I said well, fine, we'll come up this weekend. And so he did. We had an assignment to write a little nine-minute movie for the movie New York, New York. Mm -hmm. It was a sort of a movie within a movie. Okay. Uh, and we walked down to my studio and sat there and sort of knocked out a, a rough version of it, which took us maybe two hours. And then he got very antsy, and he made me drive him to the bus station, and he went home. <laughs> he didn't even stay for lunch. <laughs> uh, he later, uh, that's true, it's absolutely true. Later, he used to say to people, well, he was going to make me go on picnics or something. <laughs> uh, he just couldn't bear it. He couldn't bear it. As a matter of fact, the day Fred died, mm -hmm. uh, which was September 11, 2004, I was up in the country, and I heard the news, and my partner, Albert Stevenson, and I were talking, and talking, and talking, and talking, and talking about it and trying to absorb it. And finally Albert said, you know something, let's just do something else. And it was a glorious day. So we went down to the stream and took out some kayaks mm -hmm. and went down the stream. It was a perfectly beautiful day, and really quiet except for bird song. And at one point the, we pulled our boats up next to each other and I looked around at this glorious day and I said, Fred would just hate this. And, uh, and I was right. Earlier you were talking about um, Cabaret and working with Hal, Hal Prince, mm -hmm. and I read somewhere that there were what-if sessions. It's a phrase that I've coined, and it, uh, but it's, it's an important phrase. Writing a musical for the theater is, the, everything is about collaboration everything and fortunately we we learned that early from Mr. Abbott and then from Hal primarily primarily from Hal when we were working on cabaret and we went to Hal's house Joe Mastroff and Fred and I mm -hmm. and we would talk we would just talk at this went on for days and days and days and days and, and in, in retrospect I, I, I call it what if mm -hmm. you talk about all the possibilities of this story uh, and you should say, what if this, what if that? What if somebody throws a brick through the window? Or what if Sally has an abortion? Mm -hmm. Those are things, two, for instance, two things that actually did get, we did make use of in the storytelling. Mm -hmm. But everybody has to be free in the collaboration to do that. Mm -hmm. 
and not only does what if, the, what I call what if, uh, bring you most of the good ideas, but it also s begins to solidify the collaboration and so that you're all working on the same piece. Every once in a while, uh, you'll see a musical which is written by really wonderfully talented people. It doesn't, it's, it's not quite working. And then very often, if I ask questions around, it'll, it, it's, it's as if that element of the collaboration didn't really happen. Well, what it sounds like too is, what sounds so wonderful about it is, any question is valid. It, nothing is stupid, nothing is, you know, nothing is extraneous, it's all good for the pot. And, and it seems to So you can make a you. complete fool of yourself. When that condition isn't there, mm -hmm. uh, it's so much harder. If you have a director who has one concept, a writer who has another concept, mm -hmm. a choreographer who has his own agenda, <laughs> uh, uh, you can get in real trouble. Yeah. Now, how do you how do you tell when something is right, and how do you tell when something is wrong? Well, now you're assuming that there is. A, yeah, I mean, ultimately, because other people might say that it's wrong, or they might say that it's right, but, but you, when do you we, believe in it? Yeah. In one way, it comes comes from your stomach. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you don't know. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you're trying something to see if it work. It will work, and you put it in rehearsal or even put it in at night, and you find that it doesn't. Mm -hmm. With Fred and me, we, we wrote very, very fast. Uh, we would almost always end up with something at the end of the day, and the next day you could look at it and say, oh my God, <laughs> and you tear it up really fast. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you just know it. Yeah. Did you just know it for like New York, New York? No. You didn't? Yeah. I, well, we thought it was a good song. Actually, we're writing songs for this movie called New York, New York, mm -hmm. with Robert De Niro and Eliza. We wrote a score for it, and we wrote a song called New York, New York. Mm -hmm. And we played the songs for uh, Martin Scorsese and for Eliza, and Robert De Niro was sitting in a couch on the other side of the room. They were really nice about it, and they liked everything that we played. And we started to leave, and suddenly we, we saw De Niro motioning to Scorsese, sort of, furiously to go over the couch and talk to him. Then we saw in the distance a lot of gesticulating going on. Uh -huh. And uh, Scorsese came back and in a very kind of embarrassed way said, you know, Bobby feels that uh, the song The World Goes Round is stronger than the song of New York, New York, which is the song that he's supposed to be working on all the way through. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, I don't know how to ask you this. He said, but would you take another pass at it? Well. Fred and I were highly indignant <laughs> because, I mean, some actor's going to tell us what, what's a good song. So we went back to his house, and in about a half an hour, we wrote this other song called New York, New York, which turned out to be the song that became famous. And the other song, I couldn't begin to hum it to you. And of course, and De Niro was absolutely right. Wow, that's amazing. When they sent us back, we went back to Fred's house full of irritation and loftiness. In high dudgeon. Ah, some <laughs> actor. <laughs> and so we went into the little room, uh -huh. and as would often happen with Fred and me, it, uh, either he would have a line or I would play something. And so my hands started going. <laughs> That's all. And so uh, he asked me to play it again. Inside that vamp there is of course. Start spreading the news. And so it all comes out it comes out of a vamp, uh, which you didn't intend mm -hmm. to be a melody. This is this I is, is just something around. to put this is something to put a melody on top of. happened to us a lot. Speaking of that, the vamp of uh, all that jazz, is there any special story to that? Because that is, that's the moment for me. Just I think that was just thinking of Cheetah. And then, then, then you come
come on. I'll, I'll never forget the first moment she came in and she walked down onto the mm. front of the stage and we all knew something amazing had just taken place. Uh, we just felt this energy and it was her and it was the music and it was the Chicago. Well, it's, it's, again, you think Cheetah's going to make an entrance mm -hmm. and so all you have to do is think Cheetah's going to make an entrance. <laughs> Here she comes, that's all. It's, it's really very simple. Yeah. Those things are just lucky. Sometimes, mm, not just you lucky. know this too, that sometimes you can take something which has been hard and you work on it for weeks, mm. and then you finally finish it, and it sounds like you worked on it for weeks. <laughs> it's true. And sometimes you can sit down and mm -hmm. do something in no time at all, and it, then it's just fine. You mentioned Liza Minnelli and mm -hmm. Cheetah Rivera and, of course, countless other stars. How do you write for stars? I don't think you write for stars. You don't. I think okay. you write for people. The best example I can use for that is when we were writing Cabaret and we found out that Lada Lenya was going to be playing the role of the landlady. So what happens is knowing that and meeting her, uh, without thinking about it, her voice and, pers and persona is in the back of your head someplace. Mm -hmm. So you begin to write for that character, and if you have the luxury of knowing who that character is going to be played by, without you don't say, oh, we have to fix this for Lenya. Right. Uh, it's as, as if she writes the song for you. If Liza's in your head, or Cheetah's in your head, or David High Pierce is in your head, mm -hmm. it's not a technique. It's just that you write hearing them sing. Right. They become the voice of what you're writing. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about your use of what people call Brechtian techniques in like cabaret and, mm -hmm. and Chicago? You can't? <laughs> the reason I can't is because we didn't think that way. Okay. Uh, it just naturally just was there because... In writing cabaret and in writing Zorba and writing Kiss of the Spider Woman and any piece which has a particular time and place feeling Cabaret's easy. Uh, listen to lots and lots and lots of uh, German jazz mm -hmm. and German uh, cabaret songs of that period. Not so much Kurt Weill, oddly enough, but uh, songs by oh, Friedrich Hollander or a lot, a lot of people of that period. As a matter of fact, a, a girl I know did that painting when she found out that we were working on cabaret. It's uh, from a photograph of a German cabaret in the late 20s with an MC and two ladies on either side. And we ended up writing a song called Two Ladies. What you do is you sort of soak yourself the material and then you forget about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And hopefully whatever style that you've been immersing yourself in will come in and influence what you're doing. Lenya, before, uh, who was a wonderful, wonderful lady, and she had been married to Kurt Weill. And I said, I know that when this opens, and some of the reviews are going to say that this is sort of imitation Kurt Weill. Mm. I said, I just want you to know that that was never in my mind. And before I continued, she took my face in her hand. She said, no, no, it's not Kurt, it's Berlin. And that's right. That was what, what we were doing was uh, trying to recreate in our own fashion something that was Berlin. And she said, when I go out and, uh, at night and sing those songs, it's, it's Berlin that I hear. And I thought, well, if she felt that way, then I would never give a shit about what I <laughs> Let's see. Oh, yes. As, and I'm asking this as a former dancer. What is it like to write a, a show that is primarily dance, as opposed to something where there's little or no dance involved? Is there, is there anything different in trying to conceive something like I that? I think so. When we were working with Bobby uh, on Chicago, we've, again, I listened to lots and lots of jazz of the period. Mm -hmm. But in a funny way, Bobby's <laughs> Fosse was in the back of your head, the same way Lenya's voice. We wrote a song called Razzle Dazzle, mm -hmm. and which is dee 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 
But when we were writing it, Fred said, let's put in two finger snaps there. Bobby will love it. <laughs> and I trusted Fred on that, and he was absolutely right. Because he said, it was the moment we, he heard the, the two finger snaps, he was gone. So I think if you're writing, if you're writing for a show that's going to be heavily danced, mm -hmm. You're maybe a little more aware of rhythmically of what you're uh, of what you're doing, just from a musical point of view. I see. We're talking about directors like Bob Fosse, like Susan Stroman, like Hal Prince, like George Abbott. What would you say is your success with being able to work with such great directors? Our success? Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm sorry. Because uh, our know. success was getting to work with those great <laughs> <good> directors. <laughs> But I mean, in terms of sort of synthesizing what their vision was with what your vision was. Again, it all has to do with that talking period, that before you do anything, whether you want to admit it or not, as a writer, if you're going to do a musical which is so collaborative, at least the way we approach things, the director is the head honcho. Mm -hmm. If he's a good director, a smart director, he will be open to everything that you say and never make you feel stupid. But eventually, uh, somebody has to be in charge. Mm -hmm. Besides recognizing the great good fortune we had in working with Hal Prince and, and George Abbott and Fosse, and, uh, we always approached the collaborative idea with, with that in mind. He's the captain of this ship. And uh, we are we are full partners, but he's the one with the gavel. But he's the one. At the and if he's a smart person with the gavel, he says, "I've got the gavel, but I don't know everything." And so uh, we've all got to do this together. Mm -hmm. I have a couple more questions to ask you, John. Well, then let's go downstairs for uh, okay. Okay. This is becoming like impressive. <laughs> So John, when did you know that you were a composer? When, no, when I was four, my aunt, this is one of the big memories of my life, put my, her hands over my, her fingers over my fingers, and we made the C major chord, C major triad, and I thought, I can do that with, <laughs> with my own hand? Mm -hmm. And I was a goner. After that, it was? Uh, I don't ever remember not thinking about writing music. I don't mean like I was a great student or anything or had any discipline. It just seemed like the most natural thing in the world. And that doesn't everybody do that kind of feeling. Right, right, right. What is the work you are proudest of and why? Oh, I would say Scottsboro Boys, without question. Susan Stroman, the director, feels the same way, and Tommy Thompson wrote the book, feels the same way when he expressed that. There is something about this experience which is different from all the other experiences that I've, I've ever had. I'm a very non-religious person, but there is something it's very spiritual that's happening. Uh, and has been true all, all the way along, particularly start, started working with the group. I don't know that you could ever look at your own work and say, oh, th this is the best or this is the worst or anything like that. I just know that this is the experience which has filled me more than any other. And if, and if you ask me why, I can't tell you. Mm -hmm. And I'm so delighted to hear that it's that, because I, I think it's a beautiful, beautiful piece. And since we're speaking about the Scottsboro Boys, I know that you're a brilliant musician, but you are also functioning as a co-lyricist on the Scottsboro Boys since Fred Ebb is not here to work on it. I find that so intriguing. How, did, how were you able to focus to create lyrics that were in the same voice as your collaborator. Before I met Fred, I, I wrote lyrics, and uh, so I wasn't new to the form. But I think all those years of our working together and so closely, mm -hmm. if if it if we had had a collaboration where he 
he wrote a lyric and handed it to me, or I wrote him a piece of music and handed it to him, it would have been different. But since we worked in the same room at the same time, mm -hmm. the process was not new to me or frightening to me. When Fred died in 2004, there were four incomplete musicals. Mm -hmm. uh, the Visit, uh, The Skin of Our Teeth, the Curtains, and Scottsboro. And each one of them had a lot of work to be done on them. And again, it was I just didn't worry it too much. I'm not fast. Fred was very fast, lyrically. I'm not. But the process, as I said, is something I'm comfortable with. And every once in a while, I will look up or down and say, what the f are you? Uh, I've seen you looking up. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was fantastic. Yeah. He really was. Yeah. Uh, well, you said something I'm proudest of. The fact is that you can't tell the difference. Yeah. If it's seamless, that's, that's great. I don't know how he's going to feel about it. but it, <laughs> <laughs> I think he would be mighty proud. I wrote a song called I Miss the Music about a composer in the show who was missing his partner, this girl that he was married to. And Jason said, Jason Daniel, who was in Curtains, he said, that's about you and Fred. And I said, no, it's not. It's about you and the And he said, yes, it is. It's about, it's about Fred. And I realized that he was right. And so then I found myself writing a whole a great big section in the middle of it about a songwriter who is used to working with somebody and suddenly is, is writing along, and the difference in that experience. Do you ever see yourself working with another lyricist? Sure. I, 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 I would never have another marriage like mm -hmm. that with some, but I'm working on three tiny little pieces right now. Uh, with a friend of mine who is a playwright and a poet, and he's and and he's writing, he's written the lyrics, and they're very good. And so I'm having a good time just setting it. Now, and moving on to something at the complete opposite extreme, what do you consider your greatest failure? If you had to ask me what work do I think we did least well, mm. it would be oddly enough, Woman of the Year, for which we earned. Uh, we got a Tony for it. Really? And how, how do you... And, but, uh, yeah. By that, I mean, it, Peter Stone wrote a very funny book, mm -hmm. and Bacall was great in it. And I think the work from Fred and me, from Fred and me is okay. Mm -hmm. It's all very craftsman-like. Mm. I, I don't think we ever... This, is, this sounds really vain, and I don't mean it that way. Uh, I don't think once a score happened, I don't think we ever wrote something that was truly bad because there's a certain professional level that all of us reach where you just, you don't write amateurly. The best work is the work for which you have the most passion. And maybe that's, maybe that's why Scottsboro uh, pleases me so much. We have never been critics' darlings, but uh, We've got at least not the first time around. Not the, that's true, <laughs> but we've gotten praised for our uh, maybe least interesting work, and slammed for what I know is our is our best work. Mm -hmm. You have to be willing to accept your own assessment of of your work. Fred had a really rough time because if we got if we got bad reviews for a show, he would turn on the work. For some reason, I'm not like that. Mm -hmm. uh, we can get really good reviews for something, and if, I, and if I think what we did was ordinary, it'll be, I'll be just say, we got away with it. And if we get terrible reviews for something that I know has meaning for me, then it doesn't change it. Yeah, that I remember someone telling me um, when I was looking at some nice reviews, they said, if they love you, they hate you too. I mean, there's someone who, there who hates you too, so you can't, you can't judge that way. You have to judge from your own gut. Yeah, and I think I'm lucky that I have that. Fred remembered every bad review he ever got, which has been, we've got, we got plenty of them. You, that is, you have to judge that for yourself. Yeah. 
Okay, and what makes you happiest about composing music? I, because it's so natural. It's what I've done all my life. I could be a bank teller and still be a composer because I can't not. Uh, music is going on in my head all the time. Not good music, God knows, and not mine necessarily, but I can't turn it off. Mm -hmm. The fact that I get to do it uh, as a, an adult profession is really lucky because it would happen any, anyway. What composers and lyricists do you admire most? Mm. My heroes uh, uh, were Bach and Harnick. Really? Uh, Which I also know you had the same music publisher. Yes, that's right. As a matter of fact, the same man who introduced Jerry Bach and Sheldon Harnick introduced us. His name was Tommy Volando. Mm -hmm. The uh, my biggest influences, if you just think historically of of musical theater people, would be Jerome Kern and Mark Blitzstein. I'd, I'm aware sometimes of what I feel f from their work. If you ask me overall, it would be uh, Wagner and Puccini and Mozart. Okay. When you're taking on a new project, what's th what are the things that like will make you take on a new project? What, what intrigues you about a project? There has to be a kind of theatricality a kind of intriguing music built into it. What we do, if you think about it, if you're writing a, a, a musical piece of musical theater or an opera, you're writing in a form which, if you get right down to it, is not natural. People do not sing our conversations. But if you can find the right subject that brings it with it the right atmosphere, you can make it work. You can make it feel, you create a reality that, that's possible. The hardest thing in the world is to do a contemporary show, which is basically boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy gets girl. What would seem to be the easiest is the hardest. Mm -hmm. When Verdi first premiered La Traviata, mm -hmm. it was done in the period in which he wrote it, and it was a flop. When they revived it, they put it back either one generation or two, and it was, it was successful. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, there are some exceptions to this, but 90% of what is permanent in musical theater, whether it be opera or Broadway or whatever, is a story that is at a slight remove from, from, the, from the audience. Mm -hmm. When you hit a problem you can't immediately solve, what do you do? In life or in it? <laughs> well, tell, tell me that, because I need to know that. But, but no, your personal way of dealing with a um, part in the music, you just can't figure it out. That could drive you crazy. For one thing, I try to always be working on two things at one time. You have to get away from yeah. it. In other words, to sit there and ponder the problem and say, I'm going to stay here till this is solved, mm -hmm. you could die. <laughs> Uh, for me, it helps being able to go to another project or to uh, just do something else. Mm -hmm. And I find, and I bet you find it too, that when you're not working on it, something back here is working. Yeah, and, it's bubbling. And, and bubbling. one day, maybe two or three days later, it just occurs to you, and it seems simple. Yeah. What? are the biggest mistakes young composers make today? I probably would say it's not learning about what a collaboration is. Really even more than learning things about notation or theory or? I think those are all things that can be learned and, and with technology uh, there's some things that you can even do without. If you're gonna write for the theater, you're not just there by yourself unless you're a one man band. And even then you're not by yourself. You're right. To accept the fact that it's a collaboration and, and make it clear that you're all doing the same piece. That's something that just, I, I hammer at it, but it never gets taught. How do you work with your orchestrators? Well, I've been very, very lucky in that department. Uh, particularly for, for 20 years, I worked with an orchestrator named Michael Gibson, 
who, uh, and we became great friends. We knew each other extremely well. He taught me a lot. Since I'm, I'm not a good orchestrator myself, mm -hmm. I'm very slow. I, 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 need, I need somebody, but I need somebody who will put himself into my head mm -hmm. rather than the other way around. If you could give some advice to young people starting out in the musical theater world, young composers, young writers, what would you say to them? Don't ever feel that you have to write in somebody else's voice. Whatever it is that moves you to want to write music mm -hmm. is from you. Uh, you never need to try to be an imitation so-and-so, or uh, if, the, if that's what you're going to do, then forget about it. Did you ever try to be an Im imitation so-and-so? Oh, yes. <laughs> I wrote a one-act opera when I was in college, which is second-rate Stravinsky, second-rate Minotti, second-rate everybody I ever heard of. <laughs> How did you find John Kander? If there is such a thing as growing up, it's about learning to accept yourself as yourself. And I think anybody who writes music or writes poetry or writes that creates anything mm -hmm. has to learn how to do that. And it's not so simple. I mean, this is a question that you're going to roll your eyes, but I'm going to ask it anyway. What do you see as the future of musical theater? <laughs> I don't know. I, uh, the musical theater that I started writing in, and Sondheim, and Jerry and Sheldon, and Jerry Herman, and all of, all of my generation. I've always said that we were the last generation that was really allowed to fail. Oh boy, and, how and right still, you are. And still, <laughs> and still were. Yeah. Uh, didn't cost that much money to, to, to produce on Broadway. Uh, today, it's, it's so much harder. Every generation thinks that, uh, oh, things are not changing for the better. In the world, I don't know that things are changing for the better. In the theater, I think the theater just exists, and it keeps, uh, it keeps existing in some form or another. It always has, always will. What I miss in the theater more than anything else are producers. I think there are pl there's plenty of talent around, uh, writers, performers, God knows all it. But the world that had a Hal Prince who would produce a show on his own, or a David Merrick, crazy as he was. In other words, a producer having a vision and saying, OK, now I'm going to do this. That doesn't seem to be around very much right now. When you see a program, and above the title of the program, of, of the piece, are 20 names of people. Uh, it's their production of, and then you see it's a two-character musical. Uh, something's, something's wrong. And whether the, the future of a healthier theater lies in institutional theater or what, I don't know. I do know there's a lot of talent around and fewer people who know how to present it. Oh, what was the great Rodgers and Hammerstein song about the theater is dying, the theater is dying, the theater is practically dead? It's from Me and Juliet, which is what year? 1950 something. Mm -hmm. And somehow or other. That's it, not true. It's not true. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's the worst thing about working in the theater? Well, the worst thing about working in the theater, in the commercial theater, mm -hmm. is watching your friends not be able to earn a living. Aside from the economics of the theater, which bewilder me, there's very little wrong with it <laughs> that I can think of. I've, I know, you, you just, the, uh, so you, you, you're a positive person. I found myself one night when we were getting an award, and I'd had a couple of drinks and I had to say thank you. Mm -hmm. Saying something which sounds really Screw you. And then I realized I meant it. I think people who spend their lives working in the theater are the best people in the world. It is the most supportive group of people uh, that I can think of. 
And the hardest working. And the hardest working as well. And no matter where I go in the world, and no matter how strange I might feel in that society, if I can just get to the theater or get to the backstage of that theater, I will suddenly have a bond with, with those people. Mm-hmm. We get to experience an emotional bond with other people that other groups, I'm sorry, do not. You go from production to production to production and, and have all the, the, the creative joy of that, but you also, uh, you also fall in love with a whole bunch of people who love you back. It's a swell place to live. question for you. What's a guilty pleasure type of music for you? I feel guilty about so many things in this world, (laughs) but none of it has to do with music. (laughs) 